Done that which is evil in thy sight. Therefore, thy sentence is justified. Now he goes on in the same psalm and makes the statement I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will return to thee. So we have to find out what David found out. He could only sin against God. There is no one else. For the whole vast world is myself pushed out. I'm not playing the part against man. I'm playing against my essential being that is God. So against thee and thee only have I seen and done that which is evil in thy sight. Come in. I don't. You only started. So here. You and I must learn what he means by teaching transgressors the ways of God, that sinners will return to him. Well, let us start with a story that I got in the mail yesterday from Santa Barbara. He said, I went to my sister's home for dinner with my niece and her husband Al. And Al was full of confusion and self-condemnation, blaming the entire world of Caesar for his misfortune. Everything is going from bad to worse. Then we sat down to dinner. Before that I said to myself, should I interfere? And I thought, no. Should I use my imagination to change his and put him into a better state? for my niece's sake. And I said to myself, no, that doesn't seem fair. Why should I interfere with him? Let him, if he's enjoying this sort of confusion, let him enjoy it. Each to his own choice. It seems like I'm interfering with his choice. So as we sat down, the conversation continued in the same vein. Then came my opening, my chance. And I say to him, you know, Al, I know who you are. He said to me, or rather he said to my sister, what's wrong with her? She has known me since I have been a kid. Now she knows who I am. And then the sister said, to break that little spell, well, you see, she goes to Neville's lectures. Well, that didn't in any way comfort or in any way terrify the picture. Again, this lady says, I still say, I know who you are. And then her niece, who loved her dearly, said, she me. And then I interrupted. I said, I mean that I know that you are God, dreaming that you are Al. And if you stop dreaming that you are Al, not only Al would not be here, but Al would not exist. But now in your present dream, you're wearing a fair coat and you're lined it with atheism well if that's what you want wear it and continue in the dream but I'm only telling you I know who you are and that was the end of her little speech at dinner she said that night 
I had a dream. I was in a mountain home, my own home, way up in the mountain. And I went to the door. As I opened the door, there you stood. But it was only your head. It was you, it was Neville. But the body was Al. The same stand. He was small of stature. He was not built as you're built. But it was your face, your head. And you had a white dress in your hand that you brought for me. That you brought my robe. And I said, oh, I intended coming to get it myself. Why did you go to all this trouble? And you say, in your own voice, it wasn't any trouble. And then you gave me this white robe. And then I went in with the robe. And when I came back, you were gone. But in your place stood a lady, dressed in white. She had a package in her hand. And she said, never ask me to give you this. And she began to open the package. As she opened the package, there was this solid gold, all was flat, semi-flat, solid gold flat. Twice the size of a silver dollar, but still could be worn with a chain around the neck. On one side, there was definitely some design. Then she turned it over in her hand, and I noticed that it was inscribed. And he said to me, never wanted me to tell you, that this name that he has written on the back of this plaque is not the name by which you are addressed, but this is the name he wants to give you. I tried to read it, and at that moment I awoke. Now here is the story of the 51st Psalm. I will now teach the precipices thy way. If I know the way, I'll teach the precipices, and then sinners will return to thee. For sinning simply means missing the mark. Here that man is really missing the mark in life. He has go, everything is going against him. The ultimate mark is to awaken as God and to reflect and radiate the glory of God. But between where we are and that ultimate goal, there are numberless goals to be satisfied in this world, to have secure, to feel all the things that every man really wants to feel in this world, to feel wanted, to feel that he contributes to the good of the world, all the lovely things of the world, every man really dreams of it. But he's missing the mark because he doesn't know God. He doesn't know his own true identity, which is his own wonderful human imagination. That is God. If I turn from that to any other God, I turn to a false God. So I will teach the transgressors thy way, and sinners will return to thee. And they won't sin anymore, they'll return to thee. If I turn to the real true God, I can sin. But all my confidence in God, the only true God, which is my own wonderful human imagination. So, where is he who put in the midst of them his own spirit? As Isaiah. Where is he? Well, where else would I look? If he is spirit and he puts his Holy Spirit within me, where else would I look but within me? Will I find him as something other than myself? No. He actually became as I am, that I may be as he is. So I can't find him as something other than myself. In fact, he's not even near to me. For nearness implies separation. He is never so near that I could say, well, he's here, or he's there. He can't be so far off as even to be near. For nearness implies separation. So then where is he? He's my own wonderful human imagination. That's God. That's the only God. That is the Holy One. 
that is the Holy Spirit, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who actually became as I am, that I may be as he is. I will now teach the transgressors the ways of God, and then sinners will return to thee. So L, the body was L, the faith was mine. Well, the faith would represent the thinking processes. He is thinking it over. I wasn't present. All this takes place within my frame in Santa Barbara. She just said what she said, her sister said, but she goes to Neville's lecture. Well now, Al will require who is Neville and what does he teach? And he teaches that imagining creates reality. <laughs> that I am living in a world that is all imagination. That the whole objective world is nothing more than the projection of what men are imagining. That we are taking it and projecting it on the screen of space. And I've got to be a observant, morning, noon and night, all through the day and night, every little moment of time, what I am imagining. And what I'm imagining must in time come to pass and project itself on the screen of space. Last Wednesday morning, L.A. Times had an editorial. You might have read it. Speaking of the Manson case, that this Manson case, here, a pot boiler, a pot boiler fiction, has come to life and a pornographic fantasy was made real and then they asked the question why they should really ask that question why because they are in a tremendous position to influence hundreds of thousands of people or they claim themselves close to 900,000 papers a day and every paper is read by more than one read by two and a half or three people a day and they ask why, and yet they use the word pot boiler fiction. Here we see in the Manson case, a pot boiler fiction has come to life. And a pornographic fantasy is made real. And yet they allow all their headlines and they search the world over for something to frighten the people. And wonder why, and they use the word fiction. There is no fiction. How can there be fiction when imagining creates reality? There is no fiction in the world. I can stand now and simply dream the most noble dream or the most horrible dream in the world. And let it possess me so that I walk in it and no power on earth can stop it from externalizing itself in my world. If it takes an army to aid me in projecting it, I will use the army. They will find excuses and other reasons for the conflict. But I will remain faithful to my dream and then externalize it. I recall during the trial, there was a book written a few years ago which Manson made his Bible. And the hero of the book, he gave to as a name to one of his illegitimate sons. He so loved the book, he already had his name. And so he gave the name of the hero of this crazy pot boil of fiction to an illegitimate son. He was possessed by what the world calls fiction, and there is no fiction. How can there be fiction if imagining creates reality? So I stand here, and I think of a friend who asked something of me. Or I think of myself, what I would like in place of what I have. That I lose myself in it and sustain that assumption. And that persistent assumption, though at the moment was false, denied by my senses, denied by my reason, if I persist in that assumption, it will harden in the fact. Therefore, where is fiction? The whole vast world, yes, they then, began as fiction. But I am telling you, there is a story, buried within it all, that is the eternal story. And in spite of all the mistakes that you and I make, and 
all the horrors of the world, we are moving towards that eternal star, the fulfillment of it. And no one is going to stop you from reaching it. If you make a thousand mistakes, and you will, you will unravel the thread and start it all over again. But you're still moving towards that story. It is the walk and the woof. And the walk, here we have these parallel lines, lengthwise. But the woof, and we weave the story. And if perchance we are not weaving it as it must be done, you must follow the pattern. Well, then you'll just simply disengage these little things and weave it all over again, because you must bring it out just as it was told you in the beginning. Now we are told in the 78th Psalm, I will open my mouth in a parable and utter dark things from a road. And then he paints a word picture of the entire history of Israel. And then he comes to the end. This is the 78th Psalm. And God awoke as a man from green. He awoke after painting the entire story and then he chose David and named him the shepherd of his will. But when he awoke, he put to rout all of his adversaries. When this little man, Al, whoever he is, begins the niece's husband. If he really believed, for he wore my face, the body was his, and he wore the face. For God is a protean being, and can appear in any shape. So he's entertaining my thoughts, and that body, whatever he thinks it to be now, if he entertains the thoughts that I am teaching, I will teach the transgressors thy way. If he takes these ways and he applies them, he will see that it is not the outer world that is injuring him. And the so-called coat of hair that he wears, lying with atheism, will once more be taken off and he will wear the real coat. So for you tonight, you take the most glorious concept in the world about yourself. Start with yourself first. Take the most wonderful concept. Don't ask anyone if it's possible. I'm telling you it's possible. When I think of the fantastic things in the world that are taking place, and then when I think of what I've experienced, it puts to shame any accomplishment in the world. Not in the world of Caesar, no. I have had it. I have memory of having had the fabulous things in this world. And when I had it to saturation, I didn't grow. I had it to saturation, for my memory has returned. I walked out and left it behind. So I know what it is to have it to that abundance, to that complete saturation point. But then I didn't grow. I didn't awaken. I came back this time in an environment of extreme poverty, extreme limitation, socially, financially, in every sense of the word. In a small little thing you couldn't find, it would flew very rapidly. It would pass so quickly over it you wouldn't know it because it's only 21 by 14, the little area in which I was born stuck out in the Caribbean. 21 by 14, that's the area of the little island. Deliberately, the deep of my own being chose that for the restriction and the limitation that I would place upon myself. And then comes the unfolding of the story of Jesus Christ within me. So I could tell it to you, tell it to anyone who would listen. And how do you know where it goes? So she goes to Santa Barbara and she tells it to one who claims and delights in feeling that he is an atheist. And so tomorrow, 
because he was ahead when he came to the door. He's entertaining the thought that she expressed as thoughts coming from Nebo. And then she got the name. And she cleaned us now. That's something entirely different. That she would dare tell it. Regardless of consequences, she would tell it. So I say to every one of you, even though, like a lady said to me the other night, I saw the boy when you said it. I got more and more boring, and when it came to the very end, I was turbulent. Because you dare to tell me, I wasn't speaking to anyone individually, I was speaking collectively. But I said, you are suffering, and I use the you, seemingly in the plural, chiefly in the singular. You are suffering from amnesia, because you do not know that you are Jesus Christ. And you respond to a certain name, and I use an analogy, that if you were John Brown with a billion in the bank, and you suffer from total amnesia and leave yourself to be, well, John Smith, and you were dying of starvation for the want of a dollar, but you had a certain ethical code, a nice decent moral code, and they recognized you, but you couldn't recognize them. And they ask you to sign your name here as John Brown. That's who you really are. You think you're John Smith and you are not. He has nothing. John Brown has a billion. If you sign your name here, we can easily cash it and you would have a fortune. But he has his own restrictions, his own limitations, and he couldn't sign that thing because memory is gone. He doesn't know that he's John Brown. But may I tell you, you believe that you are John Brown, Mary Smith, Nan, this, that, and the other. And I am telling you, you are Jesus Christ. But I can tell you from now to the end of time that you are Jesus Christ, and I can persuade you that you really are, until certain signs appear within you. You can say to yourself, I am Jesus Christ, and I'm hoping that you will, and you have lovely experiences but not until the signs appear and the signs will appear in good time and then you will know without any uncertainty that you are the Lord Jesus Christ you came down into this world deliberately no one took your life you laid it down yourself you did it to overcome a world of death where everything dies there and you took upon yourself the limitations and the contraction of a thing called man. <clears throat> and you died. And continue to die. And one day you will awake. In the very grave where you ended before you began to dream the dream of this life. And you will awake in the grave. And the grave is your scar. And from that moment on the whole thing begins to unfold. Another question asks where is he? This is the 63rd chapter of Isaiah. Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? Well, God is spirit. And those who worship him worship in spirit and in truth. But where is he? Where could he be if he put his spirit in us? Where else could he be but in us? So in us, in the way. And when he awakes, he's not another, he is our very being. So I don't awake to see the Lord Jesus Christ. I awake without any change of identity. Any change, I simply am. <clears throat> and then the sign revealing Jesus Christ as my own being begins to appear within my world. And every sign that is Recording in scripture concerning him, I experience. But I experience it in the first person, singular. In a present tense experience. <clears throat> and then I know who I am. Who is he? He said, I am the father. Well, I am a father in this world. I have two children. But he didn't say that. He said, I am the father of David. Well, who in this world could have told you? I was born in the year 1905. 
Colorado speaking, David was born a thousand years B.C. That's what all scholars, if you take it in a chronological order, that's when he is supposed to be born. Jesus Christ is supposed to be born, say, four or five years B.C. by the measurement. In spirit, David calls him my Lord, my Father. David calls me my Lord, my Father. Am I not he? When David calls you, and he will, my Father, am I not he? And when he calls every being in this world, in time, my Father, are we not the Father? Then are we not one being? And is it not true there is but one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all? Who is not only above all, but through all and in all? And so you and I are one. But how can I persuade anyone in this world that we are one? But if you are the father of my son, then you have to be the very being that I am. And I am the father of that son who called Jesus Christ God. And that son is David. So after the entire story of Israel is recorded, and he tells you it's a parable, I will open my mouth in a parable. So what is a parable? It's a story told as though it were true leaving the hearer to discover its fictitious character and then learn its wonderful lesson. So I open my mouth in a parable and other dark sayings from a road. Then he recites everything that happened in the history of Israel. It isn't secular history. This is salvation history. Then we come to the end and then the Lord awaits. And when the Lord awakes, he awakes like a strong man, awakening out of strong drink, as though he had drunk beyond his capacity, and there he was completely out for the 6,000 years of his dream of life. And he dreamed the dream of life, the history of Israel, the horrors of it all. And he took us with him in the dream. And then he awakes. But where does he wake? He wakes in the very grave where he placed himself, and the grave is the skull of man. So he wakes in man. And man, in whom he awakes, is the God who wakes. And then all impossibilities seem to dissolve. At that touch of exaltation, which is rising in us, in part to our nature. And we are the very beings who fall asleep within us. I am telling you what I know from experience. I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. Every child born a woman will one day awake. And when he awakes, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he will find David standing before him a few months after he awakes. And there is no uncertainty as to the relationship between David and himself. He will know that David is his son and he is David's father. And everything said in scripture concerning Jesus Christ, you are going to be free about yourself and to know who you are. In the meanwhile, you can aid the hours of the world. You can do it at the dinner table. Do it at a bar. Do it any place. Because he said, what's wrong with her? What's gotten to her head? And then to pacify and to sort of break that little embarrassment at the moment, the sister said, well, she goes to never affection. And then the niece, to add to it, what she means is when she's interrupted. And then my friend, me and your say, I'll tell you what I mean. I mean that you are God, dreaming that you are Al. 
And if you stop dreaming that you are, you not only will not be here, you will even cease to exist. One day you will awake. And you will know, I'm telling you the truth, you are God. And the dream of being L will vanish. Because really, in the end, you were never L. I'm dreaming that I'm never. I know today who I really am. How can I, knowing who I really am, still feel the closeness to never? It's John Brown with his billion, believing himself to be John Smith. And then memory returns, for the Holy Spirit is the remembrancer. I will send you the Holy Spirit, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So when the remembrancer awakens within me, all that was said of Jesus Christ, is now being said of me. For then as he awakens within me, then where was the John Smith? If man is John Brown, and starving the death of John Smith, and then memory returns, and John Brown returns, does he still claim he's John Smith? No. That was a peculiar thing in his journey. And he believed himself that which was the poor one, the slave. And then the slave awoke to find that he was God. That is the story as told us in Scripture. So I tell you that you are infinitely greater than anything that ever walked the face of this earth. Let no one tell you that you are the reincarnation of some man or woman in this world. There are only little garments of forgetfulness. Every one of them. How flattered a man would be today if someone said to him, I know, I had a vision, and you really are the reincarnated Abraham Lincoln. Now, wouldn't he be thrilled? Or you were the reincarnated, and you named something else. All that these things are lies. Because you are God. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. You've forgotten and you're suffering from amnesia. What character on the face of this world would compare to the Lord Jesus Christ? And to tell you that you are now Abraham Lincoln come again, even though the country worships the man, and looks up to him as a great leader, and I respect the leadership, certainly I do. But to tell you that you are that come again, when I know who you really are, I would deceive you. What man that ever walked the face of this earth could compare to the thing that you really are? I am telling you that you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't mean in the sense of Charles Manson, in that peculiar little mind that took a little book, a pot boiler, and then called himself Jesus Christ, and then could murder and could slaughter in cold blood. I don't mean that at all. So let no one confuse the picture. When you actually know who you are, your infinite love, because you see every being is yourself. Because every being will one day stand before your son and know that he is the father. If he is the father of my son, how can he be other than my son? That I will know that wonderful 17th chapter of John. Oh, read it. Try to commit it to memory. To know thee the only true God. This is life eternal. I in them and they in me. And may they be one as we are one. And I have made known unto them thy name, and I will make it known that the love by which thou hast loved me may be in them and they in us. One being, and I am telling you, is infinite love. And it takes all the blows of the world 
to take us through, to bring us out to that one being who is God the Father. So no being ever walked the face of this earth that you should turn around and worship or bow to. You're infinitely greater than any character that ever walked the face of this earth. For these are only garments that God is wearing. You are the wearer. You are the one great actor who plays all the parts. Now tonight, you can take it and make it what I would say, an experiment with faith. We are told that by faith, he made everything. That faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we understand that by faith, the world was created by the word of God. So that things that are seen were made out of things that do not appear. And without faith, it is impossible to believe him. And those who come to him must believe that he exists. All right. I must believe that he exists. I can't see him on the outside. I can only know God when his son appears and calls me father. I wonder why, this lady said to me, in another one of her visions, I came into a room, and here everything was normal. I looked into the mirror, and everything was reflected but myself. But everything was reflected. When she was lifted up on high, she could see everything but herself. How could you ever truly see yourself? You see yourself only in your son. It's your son who makes you aware that you are God the Father. For God is pretty. So she couldn't see herself. And yet the mirror reflected the entire room when left her out if she wanted why. So I must call her on Sunday. Because I can't answer that letter either. It takes too long. She has to make a long, wonderful six-page letter, and another one follow with another three-page letter. And I don't have a secretary, and I don't have the time. So I will simply call her and try to explain over the phone why she didn't see herself when everything else is reflected. So I can see things in the world, but I cannot see imagination as I perceive objects in the face, for I am the reality that men call imagination. How are you going to see imagination? I see it in its works. I see it in what I produce. But I cannot see imagination. I can see what I'm imagining coming into my world, bearing witness to what I've imagined. But I am the imagining being. And I'm spirit. And so, I ask you tonight to make an experiment with faith. People go into their laboratory and make experiments and all kinds of things. You make it with faith. Now how would I do it? I do it in a simple way. First, what do I want? I must know exactly what I want. Don't let anyone tell you that you shouldn't want it. That's true. You. You're creating, so you can create it. What's wrong with wanting what comes within the framework of love? What's wrong with money? Nothing wrong with money. What's wrong with having a home? Nothing wrong with having a home. What's wrong with having a great talent and becoming known in the expression of that talent? What's wrong with it? Nothing wrong with these things. All right. Have a dream. A noble, lovely dream. And then bring it before your mind's eye and do it in a way that would imply that it has come to pass. Bring some frames into your mind's eye. And they have been seeing you as they would have to see you if you were now the one that you would like to be. Have them see you. Now, feel the thrill of their knowledge of who you are in this world of Jesus. Because they can't see you as you really are. But in the world of Jesus. An experiment with faith. You see, if you can't buy this technique, Produce what you have conceived yourself to be in this world. 
you do it over and over, it'll work for you and for everyone else. And then in time, the unfolding of the drama will take place within you. And then everything else will vanish as of no importance whatsoever. But of no importance. But in the meanwhile, while you still live in a world of Caesar and you need these things, try it. Try it morning, noon and night and live by it. And one day, you will awaken within you as you and you will know who you are. And you will know it best of all when the sun stands before you and calls you Father. For no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. So in that day when he sends, you will know the Father. And you are the Father. No mortal eye has ever seen God. But his only Son who is in his near his heart, who is nearest to his heart, he has made him know. The son stands before you, and I'm telling him, he is David, David of biblical faith. Now let us go into the science.